In a famous 1957 paper, evolutionary biologist George Williams takes up the question raised by Medawar a couple of years before of how aging, or senescence in his terms, appears. He phrases the question slightly differently. Since there is no mechanical wear and tear on living things, which repair themselves, how does senescence appear in evolution? Indeed, since senescence necessarily begins when the individual is able-bodied, it is a factor unfavorable to reproduction and it must be countered by natural selection. What is, therefore, the second force that explains its prevalence, its ubiquity and its maintenance in different species According to Williams, the relationship of age to selection has never been precisely formulated. Williams' famous answer is that some of the traits that increase an individual's fitness at the beginning of his or her life then reduce it and hasten its end. Before Williams, it was assumed that there was a mechanical wear and tear of living things that explains the appearance of a form of senescence. According to Williams, the great German biologist August Weismann distinguished between the decline of organisms, analogous to that of machines, and a specific mechanism of death shaped by natural selection to eliminate members of an old, therefore worn out, population. To be fair, Weissmann actually made such a distinction, except that the first form of aging was not machine-like wear and tear for him. But Williams is right to say that it was not clear how natural selection could produce the second mechanism. According to Weissmann, probably by the limitation of the number of somatic cell divisions, Williams first establishes that there is no mechanical wear and tear. It is just impossible to claim that organisms decay through the alteration of their parts under the insults of the environment because of the constant exchanges between an organism or its parts and its environment or their environment. Even if it is roughly true of teeth, for instance. Not only is it fallacious to, to identify senescence with mechanical wear and tear, but this mechanism would not be likely to play an important role in the appearance of biological senescence, what Medawar called innate senescence. Indeed, Weissmann said that this mechanism would explain why individuals are less and less numerous with age, but, replies Williams, Individuals old enough to succumb to this mechanism are rare in the population. Besides, such a mechanism of death is still not found after decades of research. And in the end, it is difficult to see how such a trait could be produced by natural selection. Chitteris paribus, an individual who lives older, has more offspring, so that an individual who deteriorates more slowly will be favored by evolution rather than the other way around. To counteract this would require group selection where senescence is favorable, which implies many questionable assertions. Weissmann is confusing on this point. He sometimes seems to acknowledge such group selection and sometimes not. There can be no exclusion of genetic senescence by the existence of a post-reproductive age. The central principle is the decline of selective pressure with increasing age, recognized by Haldane, Medawar, and Comfort. Comfort said that since in the wild almost no organism reaches senile age, senescence is outside of the developmental program of natural selection. Medawar showed that natural selection negatively explains the possibility of senescence. According to Williams, this theory is incorrect because it confuses the process of senescence with the state of, of senility. A 30-year-old man is not senile, but senescence is already at work 
in this fourth decade and cannot be irrelevant to natural selection. Senescence can therefore be considered as an unfavorable trait whose development is thwarted by selection. The question is to explain its prevalence by a force that thwarts its development exactly trait for trait. Pleiotropy alone can explain the appearance of senescence. William's hypothesis is that it can only be the selection of genes that have different effects on fitness at different ages. Medawar suggested that linkage and pleiotropy may explain this, but did not explore this point. Linkage could not explain it on a population scale, which leaves pleiotropy. According to the pleiotropic theory, four factors must be considered to understand senescence. 1. A soma which is essential for reproductive success but is not transmitted. 2. The natural selection of alternative alleles in a population. 3. Pleiotropic genes that have opposite effects on fitness at different ages, i.e. in different somatic environments. And 4. A decreasing probability of reproduction with adulthood. The figure here represents the fourth factor. The dashed line indicates the remaining proportion, while the solid line is the probability of reproducing at a given age. The question is to explain the link between the two curves, which Williams does through three hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that senescence results from the multiple effects of the same gene on reproduction. Indeed, a gene has multiple effects on reproduction. The selection coefficient of a gene can be represented thus. Here, the product MP is the advantage or disadvantage of each of its effects, M being the magnitude and P being the proportion of the probability of reproduction attributable to that specific effect of the gene. A gene that provides a slight increase in fitness with a high P should be selected favorably, even one that also has an effect that provides a slight decrease in fitness with a low P. The reason is that when the first one appears temporally before the second one, which must occur randomly, it introduces a form of senescence and therefore reduces the selective pressure on this second effect. Any gene whose effect is late necessarily has a low P. This explains the appearance of senescence. And when there is a conflict, natural selection will choose the young over the old. Suppose a gene that has a calcification effect. It is beneficial for the building of bones in the developmental period and increases fitness but it becomes detrimental for arteries later on, that is, in another somatic environment. The second hypothesis is that the senescence induced by each new gene makes it more likely that new pleiotropic genes will appear. Indeed, any already established gene that causes senescence increases the rate of P decline and makes it easier to establish other genes of the same kind, so that senescence self-aggravates always with the direct opposite effect of natural selection. The third hypothesis is that the appearance of senescence results from the opposition of two forces, the selection of the advantageous effects of a gene and the pleiotropy of each gene. There are thus two opposing forces on the evolution of senescence. One is indirect and tends to increase the rate of senescence by favoring the vigor of young people. The other is direct and reduces or delays the onset of senescence and thus decreases the rate of senescence. The senescence rate of each species depends on the balance between these two forces. For instance, 
a selective advantage of erythrocytes that would last forever over others that last for a very long time could be so minimal that it would be easily offset by other advantages over the eternal erythrocyte. Is there evidence to support the theory? Williams lists nine testable inferences from the theory, without establishing them properly speaking. 1. Senescence should be found wherever the conditions specified in the theory are met, and should not be found where these conditions are absent. 2. Low adult death rates should be associated with low rates of senescence, and high adult death rates with high rates of senescence. 3. Senescence should be more rapid in those organisms that do not increase markedly in fecundity after maturity than those that do show such an increase. 4. Where there is a sex difference, the sex with the higher mortality rate and lesser rate of increase in fecundity should undergo the more rapid senescence. 5. Senescence should always be a generalized deterioration and never due largely to changes in a single system. 6. There should be little or no post-reproductive period in the normal life cycle of any species. 7. The time of reproductive maturation should mark the onset of senescence. 8. Rapid individual development should be correlated with rapid senescence. 9. Successful selection for increased longevity should result in decreased vigor in youth.